see that so it's a diagrammatic representation of where are the basal ganglia in a 3d view of your brain okay the one we are looking at in the front okay we have to have tools for this this is the anterior part and this is the posterior part and this is the frontal lobe and then the temporal lobe and the to say cerebral fissure and cerebral corpus callosum in between and uh, you see the dark black one is the thalamus and uh, followed by the orange color ones the caudate nucleus the putamen and the amygdala nucleus caudate nucleus is c shaped that so it's called caudate tail has got a tail and the head body and the tail and as you can see the Yes. and then there is another thing which is called the pallidum inside putamen globus pallidus okay caudate nucleus and putamen out on laterally and medially the globus pallidus globus pallidus has got two parts the internal part globus pallidus interna and globus pallidus external part you can see this is the e part and this is the i part internal part before we go to that we require to see some other presentation mm. so when you are looking at moment disorders what is the type of what is the moment disorder what type of moment disorder is it a hypokinetic or hyperkinetic okay. basically there are two types of moment disorders hypokinesia bradykinesia akinesia parkinsonism type of disorders hyperkinesia then there will be distort and dystonia and all that chorea ethitosis hemibalismus tremor dyskinesia dystonia myoclonus asterixis tics and finally fasciculations are not abnormal movements but contraction of A small groups of muscle fibers in it, as you see in motor neuron disease, they do not need lead to an effective contraction of the muscle. So difference between myoclonus and fasciculation is in myoclonus the muscle contracts and produces a movement at the joint. In fasciculations, a part of the muscle or a groups of muscle fibers just twitch and they do not produce any. contraction whatsoever so they don't come under abnormal movements but just to make you understand that so moment disorder a physical sign of abnormal movement in the absence of weakness so the fellow has got hemiplegia and then is not able to walk and has got an abnormal movement that is no use that's not now what we are uh, yeah. talking some okay. people are still opening the mic maybe i think uh, mute you all except maghna will be made co-host so that she will be able to open her mic and also i'll make deep also because she asked certain doubts yesterday so okay so these people can open if they want okay now i'm going to mute all hello participants Yes, can Mahana? Can you open now? Yes, sir. Deepa, can you open now? Yes, sir. Okay, that's fine, and there won't be any more disturbance. Now, moment disorder is a term used for a physical sign of abnormal movements in the absence of weakness. That is important. If you have motor weakness and uh, the abnormal movement is due to the motor weakness, that is not called. A, moment disorder the syndrome that causes such motor abnormalities is a motor abnormal moment disorder syndrome a disorder that disrupt disrupts the motor function by abnormal involuntary unwanted hyper or hypokinetic hyper is an un unwanted abnormal involuntary movements hypo is a reduction in the free flowing fluid like muscle movement 
see normally when i contract my my elbow my when i when i flex my elbow the biceps contract and smoothly the triceps relax like a uh, like a free flow not like the triceps is releasing bit by bit and the biceps is contracting bit by bit it is such a smooth moment and that smooth moment is exactly what is facilitated by the basal ganglia okay hypokinetic moment disorders are accompanied by increased muscle tone of the contra of the opposite group of muscles and the pathology is mostly in the basal ganglia now let us go diagrammatically and then draw something now we will try to do a diagrammatic representation that is the cortex okay and then this cortex will send impulses to the brain stem and also some impulses to the spinal cord brain stem for muscles of the face and all the cranial motor cranial nerves and spinal cord for the voluntary muscles of the body see it is and there is another thing that is available here is the cerebellum this in a way controls the cerebellum vestibule eyes sensory input these together will influence how much of this motor movement is required at the level of the muscle of the face or of the body by sending impulses to the cerebral cortex vestibular cortical optico cortical or ophthalmo cortical and from the thalamus thalamo cortical cerebellum cortical projections and these will have this is the motor cortex and then that produces appropriate motor movement it's the first step but then there is another thing just as like the if you switch on the fan there is a starting coil and a running coil so there is there are there is one more thing that is required which is called the basal ganglia this basal ganglia have got no direct connection with the brain stem or to the spinal cord they don't have they cannot directly ask the facial muscle to contract or the elbow to contract or do anything directly if at all they have to do anything they have to get impulses from here and again send back impulses to the basal to the brain so much so they will have three types of control one is called the initiation of movement that is if you want to initiate a movement there must there must be a <coughs> initiator and that initiation is triggered by the basal ganglia the second one is inhibition of the opposite group of muscles so let's say the flexors of the elbow or to contract there is an initiatory impulse through the cerebral cortex to the flexors under the influence basal ganglia to flex the elbow biceps contract and simultaneously there will be inhibition of the extensors of the elbow which which are the triceps group of muscles and that cannot directly basal ganglia cannot do that if it were to do that way directly then the brain will lose the, the motor cortex will lose control of what is happening so the motor cortex says okay i will understand the feedback but you tell me i will tell them to what to do anyway no not giving full control to the basal ganglia the basal ganglia are under the influence of the cortex and this cortex is influenced by the basal ganglia input both inhibitory and excitatory so much so 
the excitatory things will initiate the moment the inhibitory influences from them and third one is called modulation modulation means a balance between this and this is struck and that is called the modulation so for example a dancer is dancing so a sort of coherent and rhythmic and so wonderful to look at all that is modulation all that is motor activity only that motor activity is influenced by the motor cortex primarily supported by the coordination of the cerebellum coordination from the vestibule coordination from the eyes coordination from the impulses from the joints and the peripheral parts of the body all those will tell where she is putting the foot how she is moving and where where is the light where she should look at how she should move the this one and not only that this body most of the motor thing is controlled on the controlled by one cerebral hemisphere to the opposite side and uh, vice versa and also these these controls of coordination are bilateral that means they are represented bilaterally the influence right side influences both sides left side influences both sides that is why we have a very perfect conjugate uh, action suppose you want to turn to the right all the muscles on the right side will contract all the muscles on the left side will relax if you want to look at the right side right lateral rectus contracts right left medial rectus contracts like that this sort of synchrony is achieved by the influence of the coordinating systems like cerebellum vestibule eyes and the sensory inputs you have ataxia cerebellar ataxia vestibular ataxia and then uh, eyes closed ataxia sensory attack eyes open and eyes closed ataxia all those things are a separate part now in addition a moment has to be started a moment has to be stopped or inhibited in the opposite groups and that has to be modulated depending on the requirement we should not overdo a thing suppose i want to catch a bottle my hand should not go beyond the bottle nor should stop before the bottle and it should go exactly to the bottle then my flexors of the finger should contract hold the bottle and then bring it all that is modulation this modulation is made possible by the basal ganglia not directly but indirectly through the cerebral cortex there are no direct output channels from the basal ganglia to the brain stem or spinal cord or any skeletal musculature but they have a wonderful influence through the cortex did you understand till now yes sir okay now you summarize three or four points um coming to uh, basal ganglia has no direct influence on uh, brain stem or spinal cord sir it has indirect uh, action via cortex mm. uh, uh, cerebellum vestibular apparatus um, ocular out uh, ocular uh, ocular sensory input these uh, are the sensory inputs to the cortex sir mm. basal ganglia controls the movement via, via initiation inhibition and modulation so yeah. skillful skillful activity is uh, mainly due to the modulation of the modulation is balance between the initiation and the inhibition okay now let's go to first then we said earlier bg bg is not one particular part it has got several parts what are the several parts of the control of the basal ganglia of course cortex should be one part of the entire story because that is the one which is being influenced though it is not part of the basal ganglia cortex should and should know what is going on in the basal ganglia and then you have got a c shaped nucleus and that we will call it as caudate mm-hmm. nucleus okay caudate then you have got another part called we will call it like this we'll put it vertical like this 
This we call it as putamen. Putamen. Okay. Then you have got a cake-like thing. A pie. Pizza. This pie is globus pallidus interna, globus pallidus externa. Okay, caudate nucleus, putamen, globus pallidus, and then you have got the thalamus. We'll put it in this shape, and there is a And then the, in between, the, the, there will be the third ventricle fluid going on. And yeah. then the hypothalamus somewhere here. And then there's another thalamus on the other side, the egg-shaped one, and medial and lateral part. And we have got VA and VL. OK, ventro-anterior and ventro lateral lateral nuclei. There are four nuclei. Two of them are part of the vessel ganglia. Okay. That's another called CM. It's called IP. That, the, those are the other two nuclei which we are not concerned at the moment. These are the motor nuclei, the thalamus. What is this? Thalamus. And you have got another fellow who is like a, who is speaking? This is called the subthalamic nucleus. Okay. And then you have got another fellow. Substantia nigra. Substantia nigra. Substantia nigra compacta. Some substantia nigra reticularis. Now, one cortex, two caudate nucleus, three putamen, four globus pallidus, A and B, and then five thalamus, six subthalamic nucleus, seven substantia nigra, again. Uh, C, compacta, or reticularis. Here we can say externa and interna, 4E and 4I. Now you summarize, what are the basal ganglia? Hello, sir. Mm. Now you summarize, what are the things? Cortex is not part of the basal ganglia, mm -hmm. but I have told you part of the basal ganglia because ultimately the spinal muscle or the facial muscles, the skeletal muscle has to be influenced by the cortex. And for that, the inputs from these things are required. Now you tell. Firstly, caudate nucleus, sir. Mm. C-shaped structure. And mm. uh, abdomen. The third one is... Uh, Globus pallidus, which consists of interna and externa, mm. and next thalamus, which mm. is internal uh, anterior uh, and lateral nuclei, mm. next, uh, subthalamic nucleus, and substantia mm. nigra, compacta, and reticularis. Correct. These are these are the parts of the. They interact in three different ways. That is what we have to see. All these things interact three different ways, and three different neurotransmitters are involved to understand the pathways. What are those three different pathways? And what are the three different neurotransmitters? How they influence is the story that we are going to look at. OK, now, so if you look at the brain like that, and this is the great sulcus there, and then the, you have the motor cortex, pre-motor cortex and the sensory cortex. This is sensory, motor, pre-motor, frontal, prefrontal, and that is the frontal lobe like that. And these three together will coordinate the movement. 
the motor cortex mainly gives the orders under the influence of the sensory somatic sensory cortex and the premotor cortex and there are levels at the level of cortex and there is a subcortical control arch that we need to understand so the cortex functions as a unit of motor cortex influenced by the sensory input and facilitated by the premotor cortex together is the motor area of the brain it has got two layers a layer of the gray matter which is the top and there is a layer of gray and white matter which is below that which is called the subcortex and below that is the internal capsule uh, the corona radiata below that is the internal capsule then they con converge to the thalamus into the midbrain pons and then medulla into the spinal cord this all story we know now what are the various neurotransmitters involved glutamate okay gamma amino butyric acid dopamine are the neurotransmitters involved in the bg there are several neurotransmitters but as far as we are concerned in the basal ganglia we have three types of neurotransmitters glutamate gaba and dopamine glutamate is stimulatory or excitatory gaba is inhibitory dopamine there is called dp1 and then dp2 dopamine 2 dopamine one receptors are excitatory dopamine two receptors are inhibitory now you tell um basal ganglia uh, mediates via three neurotransmitters mm. uh, glutamate which is excitatory mm. uh, gaba which is inhibitory and mm. dopamine which in turn has two receptor mediated dp1 which uh, dp1 which is excitatory and dp2 is inhibitory mm. the two not two mediators same dopamine only two receptors dp1 mm. receptors and dp2 receptors if the same dopamine goes and sits on the dp1 receptor it is excitatory if it sits on the dp2 receptor it will be inhibitory okay oh. now this is the nucleus and this is the axon part of any neuron let us say a neuron is to be uh, is what actually what what how the action potential occurs is there are some positive charges outside and there are some negative charges inside when the balance is electron neutral then there is no excitation of that particular neuron so what facilitates Uh, an action potential to start is there is what is called the resting membrane potential rmp and this rmp there is what is called the threshold potential rmp is resting membrane potential threshold potential if that crosses the threshold potential action potential ap okay this is called the post synaptic excitatory potential ps ap ps ap is post synaptic excitatory potential okay how does this happen this happens in three neurotransmitters we have got no 
let us look at the three neurotransmitters how this happens now the same diagram we are using here and here is a receptor this receptor is glutamine receptor or glutamate receptor glutamate receptor has got a little lid on that okay and there is a receptor site so if the glutamate goes and binds to that site there this glutamate to that receptor site the lid is thrown open so that looks somewhat like that the lid is open and it that allows ions to get in what will get in chloride will get in potassium will go out net result is there will be more negative charges inside and less positive charges outside potassium is positive ion it went out chloride is a negative ion which came in and that results in a sort of what is called resting membrane potential is disturbed and that crosses the resting membrane potential then threshold potential is exceeded and then that generates an action potential and that results in post synaptic excitatory potential which travels down the axon to the next neuron that is how glutamate is excitatory understand now the converse of that take the gaba there is a gaba receptor gaba comes and sits there again there is a lid that lid is thrown open now what will happen this channel allows sodium calcium to get in what will happen then there will be more of positive charges inside compared to outside that results in resting membrane potential is disturbed it is very much below the threshold potential so threshold potential is not reached then the action potential is suppressed decreased low action potential and then post synaptic inhibitory potential is generated the neuron sends inhibitory signals are deactivates the further neurons are inhibits this is what is the inhibitory that's how glutamate is excitatory and gaba is inhibitory now you tell these um, both excitatory and inhibitory parts are uh, explained mm. one in the mediated via glutamate receptor mm. where there is uh, when the glutamate is binded to the receptor there is an influx of uh, chloride channel uh, chloride ions and then a influx of uh, potassium channel. ions so mm. in turn regulate the resting membrane potential that is brings out more negative uh, charges on inside of the membrane which uh, is this threshold potential which uh, in turn triggers action potential and in turn transmit post synaptic uh, excitatory potential correct mm. now Next, coming to coming the second part mm. inhibitory which is gaba mediated when uh, gaba is uh, bind to the receptor there is a influx of both positive ions that is uh, sodium and uh, sodium and calcium um, uh, which results in uh, positive charge uh, uh, increased positive charge uh, along the membrane inside the membrane which in turn uh, increases the resting membrane potential no no and resting membrane potential is there without any change resting membrane potential is altered in such a way it is much below the threshold potential Okay. okay resting membrane potential is both are equal this side and that side charges are equal okay that is disturbed in such a way that more positivity inside means there is no chance of generating a threshold potential okay sir. okay when there is no threshold potential it's not crossed action potential is not produced yes sir 
so there is no excited uh, the excitation of the nerve down and then post synaptic inhibitory potential okay? okay now this whole thing of excitation or inhibition can lead to two types of things supposing this neuron is ending up ending in the final target organ excitatory release potential will produce a contraction or a secretion from a gland uh, or, or whatever is the function of that particular thing. If it is an inhibition, uh, the end result is the effector organ is the ending of this neuron, then the muscle is inhibited or secretion is inhibited. That is what it has. But if it is an intermediate neuron, it will have an influence on the next neuron because excitatory potential will send excitatory impulses to the next neuron and the next neuron is excited, action potential is propagated in that, and that will do whatever it is supposed to do. It is not one neuron that goes from the cerebral cortex down to the muscle, isn't it? At least we know that there are two neurons, the upper motor neuron and the lower motor neuron. And in the sensory, we know there are three order neurons. The one at the, at the spinal level, the second at the thalamic level, and the third from thalamocortical, third one. But in case of basal ganglia, there, and in other cerebral transmission, there could be a series of neurons. So any excitatory, postsynaptic excitatory potential generated can do three, uh, three things. One, it can contract the effector muscle, it can increase the secretion of the effector gland, or it can influence the next neuron to get excited. The inhibitory potential, on the other hand, it can inhibit the muscle contraction or it can inhibit the secretion of the gland or it can inhibit the wave in the next order of the neuron. Understood? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, let's go to the... I don't know when I'm going to complete at this pace, but doesn't matter. Now, how many neurotransmitters we thought of? Lu, Ga, Ba, and then what is the third one? Dopamine. Hmm? Dopamine, sorry. Dop. Dopamine. Now, there is a dopamine 1 receptor and there is a dopamine 2 receptor. Dopamine 1 receptor 1. Dopamine 1 receptor is excitatory. Dopamine 2 receptor is inhibitor. 2 receptor is inhibitory. How does that how does that do? Again, there is a dopamine receptor, and this dopamine receptor has got a binding site, and the dopamine goes and binds there, dopamine 1, and this produces uh, it uses. Uh, G protein, yes, it uses, and through the G protein, yes, cyclic AMP is stimulated. Cyclic AMP stimulates protein kinase activity is increased. Protein kinase activity releases the phosphate bond, and there are channels here, and these channels are phosphorylated. Channels are phosphorylated means they are open for if influx of positive ions. Sorry, influx of uh, yeah, efflux of positive ions. Or this is not correct. These channels are open. The positive ions go out and the negative ions come in through these channels. And that is what exactly we know: resting membrane potential. And then the positive is going out and negative is coming in is depolarization. Depolarization is this is the threshold potential that is crossed. And action potential is generated. Action potential generated means post synaptic excitatory action potential. Post synaptic excitatory potential. PES post synaptic excitatory potential. Unlike the mechanism of opening the gate and allowing the chloride inside and potassium outside, 
here this goes by a different mechanism it depends on gs protein stimulatory protein cyclic amp protein kinase phosphoryl uh, active phosphate is released and then cyclic amp is broken down to uh, you know the phosphate and that phosphate phosphorylate the channel channel is open and then positive uh, the 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 neg positive ions move out and negative ions come in which means demand depolarization starts thrusting potential is converted into a threshold potential that is exceeded then action potential is generated post synaptic action potential is generated understand now the same thing here the receptor there this is the dop2 receptor dop2 receptor goes to gi protein gi port protein decreases the rate cyclic amp stimulation so cyclic amp is increased it remains as cyclic amp cyclic amp means there is a there is a reduction in the pka phosphor protein kinase activity there is a reduction in the phosphate channels are are channels are no more phosphorylated when there no more phosphorylated positive ions influx here negative ions go there then that results in the resting membrane potential can no more cross the threshold potential no more generate the action potential and there is post synaptic inhibitory action okay yes sir so much of biochemistry is required to be known why because the basal ganglia function is so complex it is influenced by three neurotransmitters in four different ways that's why we need to know now you summarize this mm. first to dopamine receptor one sir hmm. it binds to glycoprotein stimulatory when it binds uh, glycoprotein uh, stimulatory is stimulated uh, which really uh, which releases cam which increases protein uh, kinase uh, which in turn releases phosphate which is uh, phosphorylated and it is sent afflux of phosphate and influx of uh, negative ions that is uh, in turn uh, activates resting membrane potential uh, um, threshold uh, uh, potential and action potential and ultimately leading into post synaptic excitatory potential. potential mm. next in here that mm. is the d2 mediated sir um which in turn uh, stimulates uh, glycoprotein inhibitory mm. camp and uh, decreased the phosphoprotein kinase and uh, in turn decrease in uh, phosphate levels so there is uh, increase uh, there is no afflux uh, so there will be positive charge inside sir So that no positive it, charges come in and negative charges go out. Okay. okay. Earlier the other way around. Negative charges are coming and positives are going out. Sir. So, okay. okay, sir. So membrane is internally more of positive charges. No, the more of positive charges is no use. Membrane should be negative for it to get to be depolarized. So the so the threshold potential is never reached. resting membrane potential disturbed in the negative way uh, very below the, the resting membrane potential threshold potential is not reached no action potential is generated post synaptic inhibitory status will be there okay yes sir do not understood yes sir yes sir understood sir okay now there are three pathways which control Uh, the basal ganglia what are the three one is called the direct pathway the other is called the indirect pathway okay striato nigral pathway striato nigral pathway these are the three important pathways now we have to look at each one of these pathways okay we will start with our diagram again so you should know what is that now what is that cortex 
then you have got the C there. That is the carded nucleus, right? And then we have got the vertical one for, con for understanding. This is the putamen. Okay. These two together are called striatum. You will be seeing striatum. What is striatum? Means a carded nucleus and putamen together are called the striatum. There is a carded nucleus, it is lateral to the lateral ventricle in a C shaped structure, encompassing the entire circumference of the lateral ventricle uh, and lateral to the lateral ventricle. Each lateral ventricle has got one carded nucleus right and left, and the body, head, and the tail. At the end is the amygdala nucleus. Okay, putamen is in the C limb of that. This is the C. Putamen is here. Okay. This is all carded nucleus. Okay. I have, wish I had more colors. Okay. Doesn't matter. This one is the putamen. These are lateral structures. Mid around the third lateral ventricle. And medial to that is the spike. What is that? Globus pallid. Mm, interna and externa. Okay. Now you have got the square fellow, rectangular fellow. That fellow is the, is the subthalamic nucleus. Then the dark fellow, nigroid fellow, uh, substantia nigra, and then and this is all dark, and this is the compactor, and this is the reticularis of substantia nigra. For the moment, in the in the in the first pathway, these are not in picture. And we also have the thalamus fellow here, egg-shaped fellow with VA and VL. Okay. So in the direct pathway, what are the things involved? One cortex, two carded nucleus, three putamen, four globus pallidus interna, not externa, and five thalamus, and go back to the cortex. Now tell me what are the structures that are involved in the direct pathway? Direct pathway, uh, cordate putamen, sir. Mm. Uh, and except the subthalamic nuclei, uh, substantia nigra and subthalamic nuclei are not involved. And puta okay. and globus pallidus externa is also not involved. All not involved, sir. Mm. Yeah. So now we have to say from the cortex, the impulses have to come to the. We will only draw them in the next this one. Whatever is required for the for the direct pathway, we are now writing. So the cortex part is there, and then the this is the cortex, and then we have the Cordate nucleus, within that the putamen is there, P, and this is the cordate nucleus, and there is this uh, pi fellow. After that, the internal pi fellow, we are not interested now, uh, the external one, the internal one only, we are interested, and we have the thalamus fellow, VA and VL. Now, impulses from here come to the cordate nucleus. They also stimulate the putamen, which together are called the striatum. Okay. So I'm writing here in, in, in English now cortex, striatum. Striatum is we meaning scordate plus putamen. And this produces glutamate. The, the, the neurotransmitter that is released from here, this is the nucleus, and they end up here. Let's say from the cortex it started, 
ends up in the in the transmitter coming down and then another order neuron starts from there this is the nucleus from the cortex and this is the striatum in the striatum has got two components cordate nucleus and putamen and then the glutamate is released here what is released glutamate glutamate is what it is excitatory how we know how it is excitatory because it uh, it it pushes the pushes the potassium out and allows the chloride in and then a post synaptic excitatory potential is generated i have shown you and the second order neuron start here there is an adjacent pi fellow is there this pi has got two things but it doesn't go to the first part it goes to the second part so then again the neurotransmitter and this is the second stimulus first level of stimulus is at the striatum which is a combination of caudate nucleus and putamen glutamine is released glutamine is excitatory that means it will stimulate the action potential across this across this the stimulation of the action potential and that results in release of gaba gamma amino butyric acid at the terminal and that gamma amino butyric acid crosses the post synaptic cleft and reaches the next order neuron the next order neuron goes to the thalamus the this fellow is there there is vl and vl nuclei are there and that is gamma is released and this gamma excess of uh, glutamine here produces more gaba here what is gaba gaba is inhibitory so it decreases minus is all plus 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 increases decreases the action potential so much of the amount of gab i mean action potential reaching here is less so this is an inhibitory influence is decreased inhibitory influence is decreased the second order neurons are excited neurons they go to the cortex and initiate the movement no okay cortex down to striatum you know what is striatum gaba sorry glutamate plus glutamate goes to gpi increases the gaba because it is it has stimulated it and this gaba is inhibitory in nature so it goes and reduces its gaba activity here in the in the thalamus gaba comes down because it is inhibitory and then the excitation from the thalamus goes there by this again the neurotransmitter here is glutamate <coughs> is glutamate now what has happened the first step is from the cot first step is glutamate excited second step is gaba inhibit third step is gaba inhibit and the fourth step is glutamate excited end result is whatever moment that is initiated the cortex is influenced by this pathway to initiate a movement and to sustain a movement and in a coordinated manner when an initiated movement is initiated in the flexors of the elbow an inhibition has to go to the extensors of the elbow then only there will be a smooth contraction and the indirect pathway comes and inhibits the unwanted movement inhibit the unnecessary movement inhibit the opposite group of muscle movements 
so much so the in the, the it is facilitated movement is very smooth and contract suppose there is extension the excitatory impulses go to the extensors and the second the indirect pathway inhibits the biceps triceps can't i'm taking one muscle example like that so the again i'm telling in the direct pathway what are all the things that are involved cortex striatum striatum is the cardiac nucleus plus putamen globus pallidus interna vl and vn nucleus the thalamus which send the input to the cortex okay the first neurotransmitter from the cortex to the striatum which includes c plus p is glutamate which is excitatory it excites the next order neuron excites means it produces an action potential in that neuron that neuron is excited the end result is it secretes what is called gaba this gaba is inhibitory in nature we know and this inhibits this neuron so much so there is less gaba here when there is less gaba here less inhibition or disinhibition or more of motor activity which is mediated by the glutamate so in that case what happened first level is the first level is cortex cortex to globus pallidus and uh, striatum is glutamate and that is excitatory and then that produces decrease in the gaba and then again it decreases the gaba in the in the thalamus and then the excess because there is an inhibited glutamate activity excitatory activity thalamus and impulses and the moment initiation and moment is facilitated this is what is called the direct pathway now you tell me you are asking yesterday what is direct pathway very confusing sir now is it confusing now no sir now you tell what are the structures involved what are the mediators involved and what is the i mean result at each level and the end result okay sir hmm. uh, direct pathway i will involves... write you you tell one one i will write for the sake of others what are the structures involved structures involved are uh, cortex mm, cortex striatum, striatum which in turn involve which is uh, caudate nucleus plus putamen mm, striatum striatum c globus plus p caudate caudate nucleus plus putamen mm. globus pallidus interna c p interna thalamus that is uh, when to b a v l of the thalamus yes. and, and this have the a connection to the cortex this is simplify you can make it now simply simplify by writing like this okay now what is a neurotransmitter that comes here glutamate glutamate what is its nature excitatory excitatory and then what does it do it excites these these neurons to the gpi these neurotransmitter here is gaba, gaba. so there is more in gaba mm. okay what is the role of gaba inhibition inhibitory this gaba more gaba inhibits the release of the gaba here because it is inhibitory in nature gaba production is decreased at that level in the thalamus gaba production is decreased means there is an opposed action of the glutamate there which is the glutamate going back there so that is the excitatory okay first okay. glutamate excitatory then gaba inhibitory again gaba inhibitory then an opposed glutamate excitatory and result is initiation of the movement and perpetuation This is what we said now. Three functions: initiation, inhibition of unwanted movement, and the third one is modulation. We said. So we have completed up to that part. Now, when a muscle is contracting, its unnecessary muscles are contra and opposite group of muscles 
have to be inhibited and relax not just relax relax commensurate to the contraction slowly they must relax like a smooth smooth flow of uh, the, the the movement then only the muscle will be uh, contracting otherwise it will be very jerky and very tremor tremulous very dystonic very very sort of abnormal normal movements are not like that they are very smooth abnormal movements are because the initiation and inhibition are not matched properly or rather not modulated also properly so either they are not initiated in the absence of uh, the, the in i mean initiatory impulses there will be akinesia bradykinesia if over initiated and less inhibition of other things there will be dystonia dyskinesia the modulation is poor then it will not be a smooth thing it will lead to hypertonia and hyperreflexia and then hemibelismus and it will lead to myoclonus and all sorts of things occur i don't know how far you got to the direct pathway maybe if you are free sometime we can sit and one more hour and complete it you pick up a time either today or tomorrow when all of you are available i will do the indirect pathway and the dopamine pathway also then you will know how the basal ganglia are controlling the entire movement remember basal ganglia do not directly say anything to the muscles Hey, skeletal muscles of the face, cranial nerves, or skeletal muscles innervated by the spinal nerves. Whatever they have to do, they will influence the cortex, and cortex in turn consults with the other four organs: cerebellum, vestibule, then the ophthalmic inputs, sensory inputs, and together it takes a decision. How does it have to? Such is the coordinated, beautiful. flow of movement we are having we never know we are walking dancing singing standing on one foot jump one foot jumping drawing painting sculpting playing veena playing other instruments and threading needle and so many finest movements without a trace of excess or or less uh, exactly what whatever way we want very fascinating is the control of these four organs one the cortex two the four coordinators and three the basal ganglia which involve the caudate nucleus the putamen which is called the neostriatum earlier they used to think only caudate was the striatum now we call it as neostriatum putamen is also part of the striatum that's why it's called neostriatum okay and then the globus pallidus two parts one part is the internal part is in a way excitatory and the external part in a way is inhibitory uh, so so much so a balance is struck between them the neurotransmitters involved are glutamate gaba gaba glutamate the direct pathway glutamate is excitatory it excites more gaba at the first level more gaba means more inhibition at the second level more inhibition of gaba means ga that inhibition of the pathway means less of gaba at the thalamus less of gaba means relative excess of the stimulation or disinhibition of the stimulation from the thalamus through the glutamate and then moment is initiated and perpetuated maybe we will stop here deepa and uh, meghna meghna you tell uh, did you understand yes sir so you now write a notes all of you without fail up to this point so um, yeah. whatever diagrams i have made see how the action potentials are generated what are glutamate see here how many pictures we have drawn our cells okay what are the functions of basal ganglia what are the parts of basal ganglia what are the transmitters of basal ganglia 
what are the nature of those the transmitters and how do they biochemically act and then uh, ultimately what is the first pathway what are the structures involved in the first pathway and what are the steps in the first pathway what is the end result in the first pathway 10 slides are there i will save these slides for your sake okay okay the slides are saved as png and then on that i will share the slides also and video also is is there okay okay sir. good good boys and girls i hope i i am clear enough for you to understand the mechanism here i do not know nobody has taught me like this when i was an undergraduate or a postgraduate or after nobody has taught me here and now you will know the inhibitory pathway you will know the dopamine uh, one and dopamine two the excitatory and the inhibitory roles of dopamine and then finally we go into the disorders of dopamine excess and dopamine deficiency and uh, what are all the causes of those things and there is all the uh, the clinical medicine part of it this is the pathophysiology part of the basal ganglia okay okay sir now i can see some diagrams if i have some yeah you know you can see here cerebral cortex basal ganglia thalamus cerebellum brain stem spinal cord muscle in a way they have put the same thing whatever i have put but here not only cerebellum there are other structures also here which together with the cerebellum the coordinate they send their con connections you know they went uh, to the cerebellum and cerebellum to the three peduncles superior inferior and middle peduncles communicates with the brain stem and the spinal cord to modulate the movement basal ganglia anatomy cordate nucleus putamen globus pallidus sub i mean sub salamic nucleus substantia nigra compacta and reticularis that also we have seen you now you can see the this is the cortex there and this is a little cordate nucleus on the side of the lateral ventricle and the cordate nucleus winds around round the lateral ventricle in the c shape and uh, below that is the putamen and, uh, and this is the globus pallidus there i can see the globus pallidus there and also you can see the thalamus which is green in color and in between is the third ventricle and the end of that is the hypothalamus and below the thalamus is the subthalamic nucleus and below that is the substantia nigra in fact substantia nigra is not at the level of thalamus it is in the mid brain okay now you can see in a in a real life way yeah not as a diagrammatic way the cortex there and then the caudate nucleus which is and the putamen together these are called the striatum and this is called the pallidum and uh, putamen and globus pallidus together are called lentiform nucleus putamen and globus pallidus both parts together are called the lentiform nucleus actually in fact they thought caudate nucleus and lentiform nucleus cardiac nucleus was the striatum lentiform nucleus is required for the coordination but then they realized a part of the lentiform nucleus is the striatum itself because it is mediated by the gaba so it goes in friendship with the cardiac nucleus because the transmitter there is gaba though it is structurally related to the lentiform nucleus it is functionally related to the striatum so putamen is part of the striatum functionally structurally it is part of the lentiform nucleus and then from the uh, from the interna and externa from the interna the stimuli go to the thalamus and from the thalamus to the cortex again goes and the role of the subthalamic nucleus and substantia nigra will come into picture when we are looking at the indirect pathway and the dopamine pathway in the direct pathway subthalamic nucleus or substantia nigra are not in the picture it is the cortical impulse comes down to the cardiac nucleus 
ప్రజాపుటామిన్ గాబా సారీ గ్లూటామేట్ మోర్ గ్లూటామేట్ ఇట్ స్టిములేటరీ స్టిములేట్స్ మోర్ గాబా హియర్ ఇన్ ది ఇంటర్నా మోర్ గాబా ఈజ్ గాబా ఈజ్ ఇన్నోవేటరీ మోర్ ఇన్నోవేషన్ లెస్ ఆఫ్ గాబా హియర్ లెస్ ఆఫ్ గాబా ఈజ్ మోర్ ఆఫ్ గ్లూటామేట్ దట్ స్టిములేట్స్ ది కార్టెక్ దట్స్ వాట్ వీ హ్యావ్ సీన్ వీ హ్యావ్ నాట్ టచ్ ద సబ్స్టాన్షియల్ నైగ్రా అండ్ ది సబ్తాలమిక్ న్యూక్లియస్ ఇన్ ది ఎక్స్టర్న్ ఇన్ ఇన్ ద డైరెక్ట్ పాత్ వే and uh, only in the indirect pathway and the dopamine pathway they come into picture so cortex striatum pallidum thalamus cortex that is the root na cortex striatum is globus pallidus plus caudate nucleus pallidum internum and the thalamus and the cortex simply they have written how do you understand if it is so simply you write and as i have explained to you okay the major receiving area is the striatum and from the cortex output is the globus pallidus uh, the interna here in the first part don't read some confusing things yeah this slide may be useful to you at a later stage parkinsonism involves substantia nigra hemibalismus in involves subthalamic nucleus chronic chorea in this patient is involving the caudate nucleus and the putamen athetosis and dystonia thalamus in putamen myoclonus cerebral cortex and thalamus facial myoclonus and parietal myoclonus central tegmental tract inferior olivary node body and nucleus olivodendrate fibers are the areas of the brain that are affected what is there in this yeah there are two types of movement disorders one type of movement disorder hypokinetic movement disorder and hypertonic hypokinetic hypertonic hypokinesia no initiation of movement there is no relaxation of the opposite group of muscles that results in hypertonia hyper hypokinetic hypertonia which is parkinsons the other one is hyperkinetic the action required is more than done and the opposite muscles are not restricting it they are hypotonic and that produces a dyskinesia instead of a beautiful eukinesia we have eukinesia where the groups of muscles contracting will contract properly and the other groups of muscles opposite group of muscles relax and then gradually give uh, required amount of release for this moment and you have a eukinesia in case of hyperkinesia the the stimulatory muscles are over excited the overdo overshoot and the controlling muscles are not able to hold the tone and they become hypotonic so the end result is a dyskinetic movement or hyperkinetic hypotonic dyskinesia can be tremor chorea dystonia tics myoclonus hemibalismus or balismus and of course the fasciculations are listed but they are not part of abnormal movements the difference between myoclonus and fasciculation myoclonus results in the contraction of the muscle and movement at moment or no movement at the joint but muscle contraction can be seen whereas in case of uh, fiber contraction twitching or fasciculation muscle doesn't contract only that group of uh, fibers contract and there is no movement absolutely at the did you understand anything yes sir yes sir Yeah. Uh.